Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending October 24th. First up, this is from the Washington Post. Federal regulators to require registration of recreational drones. Now this is creating quite a stir, not just the people that are against complete registration of the drones, especially like the, we're talking about the DJI Phantom and the other kind of drones that take cameras about the size of a GoPro and things like that into the air. Um, they've been subject to certain regulations to start with as far as uh, they've asked people that fly the drones not to fly above 400 feet in the sky and things like that. But now the the thing comes up too, what about people that buy these $20, $40 uh, little toy drones, like a, a toy you could buy at Radio Shack, these little tiny miniature ones that most people don't even fly outside because they're, they're so small. Are they going to have to actually uh, be subject to some kind of licensing and regulation thing just for getting a little toy drone? So if they don't make some kind of an exception to that for a little bit smaller drones, uh, it's going to get really complex. But uh, yeah, right now they're not, they're going to supposedly come up with a plan within the next couple of months to do this before they hope to make it before Christmas time. So if you want to check this out, there's also a video included down below if you want to check that out. But uh, yeah, if you want to also uh, tell the FCC what you feel about this idea of the regulations too, it would be the time to uh, contact them, you know, give them some kind of a uh, an idea of what you feel about this uh, new set of regulations. And next this is from sciencemag.org. This is only 8% of the universe habitable worlds has formed so far. Uh, this, this basically is just maybe a little over a paragraph, so I'll just read most of this. Uh, really, there isn't much else about it, but it's still, to me, it's kind of interesting to think about that. There are likely hundreds of millions of Earth-like planets in the Milky Way today, but that's a small fraction of the number that may be throughout the universe in the future, a new study suggests using data from the Hubble Space Telescope. Researchers estimated the rates of past star and planet formation in the universe, which are is now at about 13.8 billion years old. Then they combine the information from data from previous surveys that estimated the amounts of hydrogen and helium left over from the Big Bang that still haven't collapsed to form stars. At the time, our solar system formed about 4.6 billion years ago. Only about 39% of the hydrogen and helium in our galaxy had collapsed into clouds and then evolved into stars, they say. That means the remaining 61% is available to form future solar systems that may include Earth-like planets in their habitable zones. The research report online today is monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society in the Universe. As a whole, the researchers suggest only 8% of its original star-making gases was locked up in stars by Earth's first birthday. The rest will, over the remaining trillions of years of the universe's lifetime, coalesce into stars whose solar systems will contain a myriad of Earth-like planets. So, yeah, we may be in the stages of the universe where there is just uh, very few, at least comparatively very few, uh, advanced civilizations or at least uh, planets that are habitable for life. Somebody in one of the comments on one of the articles I saw where they were commenting about this saying something about how about the period of time between the Big Bang and when outer space cooled off to pretty close to absolute zero, which it is right now, how about that time in between when the universe itself was at a temperature of, say, room temperature 70 degrees, 80 degrees, something like that, when you could actually have liquid water, how about that uh, life forming during that time. Well, the only problem with there is you don't have any kind of complex chemicals. You have hydrogen, helium, and maybe a trace of a, a few other things, but you don't really have any hydrocarbons. You don't have any surfaces. You don't have any clumping together of matter. You just have this uh, strung out gas at about 70 degrees temperature for a period of time in the universe. But at least I can't think of anything that would be any kind of life like we would know it existing in those kind of conditions. So I'd say that's very highly unlikely, but somebody did bring that up. And somebody else answered the comment and shot it down right away, too. Okay, this next one, this is called the Zeno effect. That's, uh, uh, people say that in, qu in quantum things, there's some experiments you can do like this, and they say in the quantum realm that when you're actually viewing an experiment or viewing the particles in the quantum realm, the actual fact that we are viewing and looking at the particles has an effect on the way those particles act. Well, this is, I'll read the first part of one of the oddest predictions of quantum theory that a system can't change while you're watching it has been confirmed in an experiment by Cornell physicists. Their work opens the door to a fundamental new method to control and manipulate the quantum states of atoms and could lead to new kinds of sensors. What they did was they didn't exactly directly look at these quantum particles. Obviously, you can't because they're so small, but what they did was they actually shined a type of light on them 
and they noticed the tunneling effect. The more and more light that they shined on it, you had less and less of the tunneling effect of uh, certain atoms just being able to move in place in a crystal lattice. So it seems like the more that we're able to actually look at and determine a system in a quantum state, the more we have an effect on it, in this case an effect to actually freeze it and have it uh, be completely still. So you don't actually have any quantum movements or no quantum tunneling of the particles themselves. Quite a long article, but still very interesting if you're into this really kind of super geeky stuff. And I got two more articles for you here, and one of them is going to be about a drone again. This is from my friend Len Skapoff from YouTube. UK firms deploy drone freezing ray, and evidently it's not just the UK. Evidently the US has been uh, testing this too. The anti-UAV defense system, AUDS, A-U-D-S, works by covertly jamming a drone signal, making it unresponsive. After this disruption, the operator is likely to retrieve the drone, believing it has malfunction. What they basically do is just overload it with a super strong signal, so the drone is just confused and it freezes in place. Then what they can do is kind of ease back and then let the person controlling the drone bring the drone back, thinking there's something defective. Or if the person doesn't want to comply, they basically just keep the drone frozen for 15, 20 minutes until the batteries run out and the thing basically falls down and, and crashes. So. Yeah, it's another way, and they also talk about at the end of the thing your real obvious things too, like uh, your your weapons, like your just your standard weapons, like uh, anti-aircraft uh, guns and things like that that can take the drone out of the air, explosives, um, you know, no more no more sophisticated than just a shotgun. So they talk about that at the end too. Yeah, obviously, if you don't want to get really sophisticated or something like that, you can uh, take the equivalent of a military type of 12 gauge shotgun and shoot it out of the air. But yeah. Another article about another way that they're talking about dealing with drones in the future. And it says, Ouds has been tested in the UK, the USA, and France, said Mr. Taylor, and government organizations in all three countries that have been involved in these tests. And last up, this one is from, let me get this right, this is my friend Harry T. A lot of you that are science geeks like me probably know what a tokamak reactor is and know that... Um, we're trying to build larger and larger ones with more magnetic force to try to trap gas plasma in place and have successful fusion. It's the one type of energy to where you actually produce more energy than you use, but we still have not got quite to the break-even stage. Well, this is a bizarre new reactor that might save nuclear fusion. If you've heard of fusion energy, you've probably heard of tokamak. These donut-shaped devices are meant to cage ionized gas called plasmas in magnetic fields. Well, this one itself is called a Stellarator, I believe it is. There, yeah, it's called a yeah a Stellarator, the largest. There, Germany's making the largest ever built, a one billion dollar machine, known as Wendelstein 7X. It appears now as a 16 meter wide ring of gleaming metal, bristling with devices of all shapes and sizes. Got something like 250 ports going into it for various purposes. And the thing about this is. It may be successful just based on the fact that with computer technology and the kind of precision machining we can do now, this thing is kind of like a twisted donut, and it has its advantages too. Instead of using the tokamak uses brute force, and it's a little bit simpler, but it needs a lot of brute force to take to, to have it happen. This is more like the finesse method where you uh, don't use quite so much brute force to get to the same end result, but you also have to be very, very technically accurate every step along the way. And by putting the plasma in this kind of twisted form, if you can keep it stable in this twisted form using a lot of computational power and varying of the magnetic field, they may be able to, they think they may be able to beat the tokamak into having an actual true fusion reaction. And uh, I'll put up a picture of this thing too, just how complicated it kind of looks like. It, it, to me, it looks kind of like uh, the uh, uh, Star Wars, the, uh, uh, what you call it, the ship that Han Solo um, flies, but with a lot more stuff uh, stuck on it, the Millennium Falcon, a Millennium Falcon with way more stuff stuck on it, and then I'll show you a picture of the way the coil is too, and this thing has to have a millimeter precision in every part of it, you know, to be able to keep this thing working accurately, so just putting it together with something like 1.1 million man hours, and a couple times this thing got halted just for budget concerns, but now they're going to see it all the way through and actually fire this thing up and give it a test, so. Anyway, that's about it for this week. Thank you again, everybody that contributes to the TDD report. It makes it so much easier to do it with the contributors. And take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.